Section 10 of Oscar Wilde, Art and Morality, A Defence of the Picture of Dorian Gray, edited by Stuart Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. Section 10 when it the public says a work of art is grossly unintelligible it means that the artist has said or made a beautiful thing that is new when it describes a work as grossly immoral it means that the artist has said or made a beautiful thing that is true the former expression has reference to style the latter to subject matter this again led to further correspondence and after an interval of two weeks oscar wilde returned to the charges levelled against his book and replied for the third and last time his letter dated from sixteen tight street chelsea thirteenth of august eighteen ninety was as follows sir i am afraid i cannot enter into any newspaper discussion on the subject of art with mr whibley partly because the writing of letters is always a trouble to me and partly because i regret to say that i do not know what qualifications mr whibley possesses for the discussion of so important a topic i merely noticed his letter because i am sure without in any way intending it he made a suggestion about myself personally that was quite inaccurate his suggestion was that it must have been painful to me to find that a certain section of the public as represented by himself and the critics of some religious publications had insisted on finding what he calls lots of morality in my story of the picture of dorian gray being naturally desirous of setting your readers right on a question of such vital interest to the historian i took the opportunity of pointing out in your columns that i regarded all such criticisms as a very gratifying tribute to the ethical beauty of the story and i added that i was quite ready to recognise that it was not really fair to ask of any ordinary critic that he should be able to appreciate a work of art from every point of view i still hold this opinion if a man sees the artistic beauty of a thing he will probably care very little for its ethical import if his temperament is more susceptible to ethical than to aesthetic influences he will be blind to questions of style treatment and the like it takes a goethe to see a work of art fully completely and perfectly and i thoroughly agree with mr whibley when he says that it is a pity that goethe never had an opportunity of reading dorian gray i feel quite certain that he would have been delighted by it and i only hope that some ghostly publisher is even now distributing shadowy copies in the elysian fields and that the cover of goethe's copy is powdered with gilt asphodels you may ask me sir why i should care to have the ethical beauty of my story recognised i answer simply because it exists because the thing is there the chief merit of madame bovary is not the moral lesson that can be found in it any more than the chief merit of salambeau is its archaeology but flaubert was perfectly right in exposing the ignorance of those who called the one immoral and the other inaccurate and not merely was he right in the ordinary sense of the word but he was artistically right which is everything 
the critic has to educate the public the artist has to educate the critic allow me to make one more correction sir and i will have done with mr whibley he ends his letter with the statement that i have been indefatigable in my public appreciation of my own work i have no doubt that in saying this he means to pay me a compliment but he really overrates my capacity as well as my inclination for work i must frankly confess that by nature and by choice i am extremely indolent cultivated idleness seems to me to be the proper occupation for men i dislike newspaper controversies of any kind and of the two hundred and sixteen criticisms of dorian gray that have passed from my library table into the waste paper basket i have taken public notice of only three one was that which appeared in the scots observer i noticed it because it made a suggestion about the intention of the author in writing the book which needed correction the second was an article in the st james's gazette it was offensively and vulgarly written and seemed to me to require immediate and caustic censure the tone of the article was an impertinence to any man of letters the third was a meek attack in a paper called the daily chronicle i think my writing to the daily chronicle was an act of pure wilfulness in fact i feel sure it was i quite forget what they said i believe they said that dorian gray was poisonous and i thought that on alliterative grounds it would be kind to remind them that however that may be it is at any rate perfect that was all of the other two hundred and thirteen criticisms i have taken no notice indeed i have not read more than half of them it is a sad thing but one wearies even of praise as regards mr brown's letter it is interesting only in so far as it exemplifies the truth of what i have said above on the question of the two obvious schools of critics mr brown says frankly that he considers morality to be the strong point of my story mr brown means well and has got hold of a half truth but when he proceeds to deal with the book from the artistic standpoint he of course goes sadly astray to class dorian gray with monsieur zola's la terre is as silly as if one were to class musset's fortunio with one of the adelphi melodramas mr brown should be content with ethical appreciations there he is impregnable mr cobham opens badly by describing my letter setting mr whibley right on a matter of fact as an impudent paradox the term impudent is meaningless and the term paradox is misplaced i am afraid that writing to newspapers has a deteriorating influence on style people get violent and abusive and lose all sense of proportion when they enter that curious journalistic arena in which the race is always to the noisiest impudent paradox is neither violent nor abusive but it is not an expression that should have been used about my letter however mr cobham makes full atonement afterwards for what was no doubt a mere error of manner by adopting the impudent paradox in question as his own
and pointing out that as i had previously said the artist will always look at the work of art from the standpoint of beauty of style and beauty of treatment and that those who have not got the sense of beauty or whose sense of beauty is dominated by ethical considerations will always turn their attention to the subject matter and make its moral import the test and touchstone of the poem or novel or picture that is presented to them while the newspaper critic will sometimes take one side and sometimes the other according as he is cultured or uncultured in fact mr cobham converts the impudent paradox into a tedious truism and i dare say in doing so does good service the english public likes tediousness and likes things to be explained to it in a tedious way mr cobham has i have no doubt already repented of the unfortunate expression with which he has made his debut so i will say no more about it as far as i am concerned he is quite forgiven and finally sir in taking leave of the scots observer i feel bound to make a candid confession to you it has been suggested to me by a great friend of mine who is a charming and distinguished man of letters and not unknown to you personally that there have been really only two people engaged in this terrible controversy and that those two people are the editor of the scots observer and the author of dorian gray at dinner this evening over some excellent chianti my friend insisted that under assumed and mysterious names you had simply given dramatic expression to the views of some of the semi-educated classes of our community and that the letters signed h were your own skilful if somewhat bitter caricature of the philistine as drawn by himself i admit that something of the kind had occurred to me when i read h s first letter the one in which he proposed that the test of art should be the political opinions of the artist and that if one differed from the artist on the question of the best way of misgoverning ireland one should always abuse his work still there are such infinite varieties of philistines and north britain is so renowned for seriousness that i dismissed the idea as unworthy of the editor of a scotch paper i now fear that i was wrong and that you have been amusing yourself all the time by inventing little puppets and teaching them how to use big words well sir if it be so and my friend is strong on the point allow me to congratulate you most sincerely on the cleverness with which you have reproduced the lack of literary style which is i am told essential for any dramatic and lifelike characterization i confess that i was completely taken in but i bear no malice and as you have no doubt been laughing at me up your sleeve let me join openly in the laugh though it may be a little against myself a comedy ends when the secret is out drop your curtain and put your dolls to bed i love don quixote but i do not wish to fight any longer with marionettes however cunning may be the master hand that works their wires let them go sir on the shelf the shelf is the proper place for them on some future occasion you can relabel them and bring them out for amusement
they are an excellent company and go well through their tricks and if they are a little unreal i am not the one to object to unreality in art the jest is really a good one the only thing that i cannot understand is why you gave the marionettes such extraordinary and improbable names i remain sir your obedient servant oscar wilde the correspondence continued for three weeks longer but oscar wilde took no further part in it end of section ten